Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. <laughs> morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club. We have a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. Linda Sarsour. Welcome. Sarsour. Sarsour. Did I say it right? Yeah, you all right. You oh. all right. You've got all, <laughs> 10 more years, you're going to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> She got a new book out called We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders. Explain that title, because that's hard. Listen, it's like the right book at the right time. It's exactly what it says. You know, We're not around to just sit around and watch injustice and watch all the stuff that happens around us and just be like, this must be how it is. So the book is basically a call to action, like get up and do something, say something, stand up for yourself, stand up for your family, your community. Uh, and there's a lot of stories and people you know in my book and the mm -hmm. work we've done. We've been on The Breakfast Club before, and I tried to capture us like in our essence in our humanity with our families so mm -hmm. hopefully folks check it out you what? talk about yourself too and finding your voice at an early age so share some of that because for some people they still haven't found their voice and some people are still struggling with not being bystanders absolutely um you know for me i tell people all the time there's really nothing extraordinary about me i'm born and raised in brooklyn i'm a daughter of immigrants i'm a you know i went to public school like a lot of people you know in new york city and around the country and for me it's like everybody got it inside of them you just gotta you just gotta stand up you gotta realize that if you know, you see something happening and you don't say something, then it's going to happen again to somebody else, to somebody else, to somebody else. And sometimes going to get to your doorstep. It might be your child. It might be somebody that you love. So you just got to find, be the person to kind of break that cycle. So for me, saying we're not here to be bystanders is a decision you make. And we've seen this before. Sometimes you're on the train and you see a young woman getting harassed or something. You know, you got to ask yourself a question. Are you going to stand there and let it happen? Or are you going to be the one that's going to be like, hey, leave her alone. Even that very simple action that you could take on a train or on a bus or in the street, that for me is another way to reflect that you are not here to be a bystander. I'm not gonna lie, when I read this book, and I know you say that you feel like you're a normal person, I feel like you're a superhero. And the reason I say that is because some people are, are here to help and assist others and, and to save others. And I know it's a thankless job, but I feel like that's your purpose. Like, when did you realize that? I appreciate that, um, Charlemagne. For me, it was um, the horrific attacks of 9-11. A lot of people, mm. you know, saw me, Tamika, and Carmen at the Women's March and thought that was kind of how we came up. Like, we just kind of came out of nowhere. But we've been organizing. Voltron. Yeah, we've been organizing for a long time. For me, it was 9-11. It was like, one day you're a regular Muslim walking around New York. Nobody really looks at you twice. Then something horrific happens. A lot of innocent people die. And it happens that the people who commit this act of terror must are Muslims. And all of a sudden, you go from being a regular New Yorker to a suspect, right? Mm -hmm. That you're part of some suspect community that, you know, had actually nothing to do with that horrific attack. And I'm in Bay Ridge, where I'm from, which is Southwest Brooklyn, believe it or not, and, you know, unless you lived in my community, you would have had witnessed this, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, raids of law enforcement, going into the buildings, pulling men out into the streets, laying them down, on the, and you're watching from the window, like, what is happening here? Like, these people came from countries where the same thing that was happening to them in, in New York happened to them in their country. So mm -hmm. they're fleeing to come to America, find this land of democracy where they could be free and they could be who they want and all of a sudden fathers are being taken moms are crying in the street and i was looking like this is not okay this is not right and so for me that was like my radicalizing moment i was like i'm not going to sit by and let this happen so of course i'm bilingual so i speak arabic and i speak english started translating for these moms these wives trying to find their husbands in like the abyss of law enforcement like the dark holes of the metropolitan federal detention center new jersey they were going to pennsylvania i don't even know where they were taking them and that's how I got into this. I was I was in college studying to be a high school English teacher. That was what wow. I, I got a simple, I had a simple life. <laughs> yeah, you talk about that in chapter five, the everything changed chapter about the 9-11 mm -hmm. attacks. Did you feel like your community w was being terrorized? Oh, or absolutely. Y'all under Ooh. attack. It was, <laughs> it was to the point where, you know, like you just started feeling like you couldn't, like there were women who, other allies in our community who were not Muslim were walking their kids to school in the morning because not only were you being terrorized by law enforcement, you were afraid that you could get picked up, cab drivers. There were, for a little while, some of the stores were closed down. I remember the day of 9-11 when I walked back from, I uh, was going to Kingsborough Community College. I walked all the way back from, and that's a long way. It's like a two hour walk because there was no public transportation. My mosque door had a gate down. I never seen in the 20 years that my mosque was open, I didn't even know my mosque had a gate because it always was open. And the fact that it was closed, like, it shook me because at the time I didn't even know what had happened. Because, you know, we didn't have no Twitter, no Facebook at the time. There were no flat screen TVs in the college campuses for you to know. So imagine just walking and, and you know, Kingsborough Community College is on Manhattan Beach. 
So when I walked out of my campus, there was literally like a snowflakes of paper, burnt paper that were falling from the sky, and you still didn't know what happened. Right. And so for my community, absolutely, and also the discrimination. Like mm-hmm. one day your neighbor's your friend, and you're you know talking outside, and then your neighbor don't want to talk to you no more. Like mm-hmm. people giving you looks, and the and there was uh, as you know increased hate crimes against women, particularly ones that wear hijab because who are easily identifiable, um, and that continues till today. And I'm just like, look, twenty, you know, nine eleven happened 19 years ago. It was a horrific day. But there got to be a moment when we come together and be like, we got to move on. You like, give people we- a pass, you know, and the reason I asked that is is because I remember being a kid back then. It was like the press made it so we hated Muslims. Mm-hmm. That's that's what their that's what their goal was, I believe, back then, to the point where I remember being a child and not necessarily understanding. And every time I would see somebody with garb on, I would get a little nervous. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm sure that's the same way white people look at black people when they see black mm-hmm. people with a hood on. Like they get a little nervous. And it was like not until... I got a little old and start understanding and realizing that that was wrong. You know, do you give people a pass when 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 they when they have those conversations? Your neighbors who might not have known at those times. Yeah, I mean, I'm one of those people. Not everybody's like me. Like, I'm willing to have the conversation. If you're really coming from a place of fear or a place of like, you know, you just don't know, know let me yeah. have that conversation. And in fact, it's why I wrote my book. Mm-hmm. You don't want to talk to me. You don't want to talk to a Muslim. That's cool. You don't feel comfortable. Why don't you just read this book? Because the book is not really about me. It is my story and my journey, but it's really my people. Like, my people are in this book. Like, I'm trying to figure out a way to show you, like, it's not that I'm saying, like, oh, you and me are the same. We're not the same. And that's okay. I don't want to be the same as you. I want you to know that we can all live in this country and coexist together. Just treat me with some respect and some dignity. And that's what we all want. You know, we've come on the show before and we talked about, you know, police brutality. We talked about young men, black men and women being killed at the hands of law enforcement. You know, it's not about I want you to be like, oh, we're, we want to be like black people. Black people are like us. But that child <clears throat> is somebody's child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's somebody's husband. That's somebody's boyfriend. That's someone, somebody loves that person. And for me, it's like, I love my kids too. Why should my kids be bullied in a public school system by your children? Because your children watch something on Fox News or are watching movies in Hollywood where the Muslims are always the hijackers. We're always the enemy. We're always the bad guy. You know, it's hard. It, it rarely do you watch something where your kid can watch something and be like, wow, like, I want to be that guy. You know, I want to be that woman. Mm-hmm. Like, the Muslims are never that. And for me, like, I owe it to my people. I owe it to my kids, too, who have been through a lot. You know, Tamika and us, like, we've Absolutely. been through a lot of stuff. I mean, we've been, um, you know, death threats, you know, people harassing us, like, online bullying. I mean, for me, last, just a couple of months ago, when that guy in Florida got arrested, the MAGA guy, Caesar Sayoc, got arrested for sending pipe bombs to Obama and to Hillary and to people who he believed were in opposition to Donald Trump, the FBI came to my house. And I was like, why are you here? You know, I explained the story of, of course, elongated in the book. And they were like, we're just here to inform you that the national FBI sent us to let you know that when we raided the home of Caesar Sayoc in Broward County, Florida, that he had addresses for you. So I was next on a list to get some pipe bomb. Now, mind you, I you ain't. Did get a, you did get a crazy package once. I sure did. Mm-hmm. Um, and for the for the Caesar Sayoc guy, imagine he didn't get arrested. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. President Obama. President yeah. Obama got Secret Service that intercepts his mail. Yeah. Hillary got, you know, interception. Like, for me, I'm like you. I go out to the mailbox and I get my own mail. You know what I mean? Same thing. Like, when I'm not home, my kids are going out to the mailbox. Mm-hmm. You know, they get Amazon packages. How am I supposed to explain to my kids what is the right package and what is not the right package? Right. Like, this is serious work that we do. And you may not always agree with us, which is cool. And people don't always agree. And it ain't about agreeing. But you got to at one point say, like, look, this is America. Like, they're free to believe what they believe. They're free to organize. They're free to say what they want to say because that's what America is all about. And we found ourselves in a place that even in this country, people are trying to find ways to silence our voices. And my book is a kind of a testament to saying I'm not going to be silenced. I'm telling my story. I'm going to get published. My book is going to be in Barnes & Noble. You're going to figure out how to, at some point, you're going to have to come to terms, and hopefully it will be through the story. Now, what was Ninja, the strange package know. that you got? What, what, what was that package that Charlamagne mentioned? Yeah, uh, that was crazy. It was crazy. It was, uh, I was in Arizona. My mom calls me, gets a package. It looks suspicious. It says on the outside, uh, Sarsour for city council. Obviously, I wasn't running from city council, so it already looked suspicious. My brother came, put on some gloves, opened it up, and it's a scrapbook. And the scrapbook got photos of my kids in it. Mm. And my mother starts screaming. And it's like, you know, it's like they're just getting really personal. They had a photo in there of a cousin of mine claiming that 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 picture, because my cousin doesn't wear hijab like me, being like, that was me before I wore hijab. Just randomly 
and you sending that to my mom's house of all places. So my mom is a little immigrant lady, you know, from Sunset Park, and she just went wild because the fact that you know my parents' address to be sending the mail, mm-hmm. the fact that you got photos of my kids, and if you look at my social media, I don't be putting photos of my kids up right. there because I'm trying to protect them. In fact, I changed my kids' last name. They don't have the same last name as me. And people Damn, are crazy. Think about all that. I changed your kids' last name just they don't, to Yeah, them? Don't, they don't have the... I mean, the other day, my son is a university student, and uh, the 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 his professor just randomly was given a lesson. She's um at, you know um you know sh- sharing a lesson or whatever. She happens to mention my name, and then my son later on he already had her two semesters in a row. Later on, my son goes and whispers to her. He's like, um, just want you to know, you know, that's my mom. And so the 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 professor was like, you should be like telling everybody that's your mom. He was like, no. He's like, I don't be telling everybody that's my mom. But I wanted you to know because he felt like yeah. a little solidarity from her. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So the fact that my child can't be in university and be proud and be like, that's my mom up there, tells you everything that you need to know about the type of like circumstances that a lot of us got to live when, you know, I go to a protest. I be protesting all the time. My son and my daughters be at the protest, but right. they be nowhere near me. Right. They want to be part of my work. They believe in what I believe in, but they can't because if something happens... They're the first ones they're they gonna get got, right? Now let me ask you a question: Did they ever find out who sent you that stuff and all that, or no? The FBI found out. It's a guy that lives up here on the Upper East Side. Like this is not even what? a guy that lives okay, in. Yeah. It doesn't like it's not a guy that lives in like you know I don't know Tennessee somewhere. Like this is a guy in my city, who um, the FBI tracked, and they just went to his house because you know sending me a package, technically speaking, is not like oh my god. He, they were like you better back. You know the FBI basically was like you better back up. Like this better be the last time you ever try to that contact this lady. We're watching you. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now, Linda, you talk about your decision to wear the hijab also in the book, mm-hmm. and I'm sure there's other people out there who are uh, trying to figure out what they want to do as well. Other Muslims who are mm-hmm. like, should I wear mine? Should I not? So explain why you decided that it was time for you to start wearing your hijab. Absolutely. I mean, for me, I just want folks to understand that not every Muslim wears a hijab. So there are many Muslim women around in New York City, outside New York City, all over the world that do not wear the hijab. I chose to wear the hijab. For me, the hijab just is a signifier of who I am. Like when I walk down the street, you may not know I'm Palestinian. You may not know I was born in Brooklyn until you hear my voice, but Mm -hmm. you will know I'm Muslim. And so for me, it's a a, it's a point of pride. Um, We know when I was growing up, my name was Linda. You know, people thought I was Puerto Rican. They thought I was Dominican. They thought I was all kinds of other things, but they never really thought about who I actually was and so for me this becomes originally started as more of like an identity and then as I grew older it became a very spiritual part of me I mean for me um, you know hijab actually just means modesty that's Mm. really what it is and for me like you know everybody gets to have the agency to wear what they want when they want and for me I have the agency to choose to wear the hijab and to have people judge me by my character by my deeds and not necessarily always be like you know focused on like the more exterior type of things that we usually learn about in the shallow society. That's what that's what I love about the book. It it, it gives I don't want to say new meaning. It gives the real meaning to a lot of these things people have stereotypes for. Like in the first chapter, uh, the choice I made, you speak about the true meaning of jihad. Mm-hmm. Could, you, could you explain that? Yeah, I mean, one time I got in big trouble. I mean, to the point where like Donald Trump Jr. got in on it. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, I was at a Muslim convention. I gave a speech to the Muslims. You know, those are my people. I know how to talk to them. I know the language. You know, and I gave this uh, story about. Um, the, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, uh, may peace and blessings be upon him, which is our Prophet. Um, we obviously also believe in Jesus and Moses. And I shared a story where a guy asked the Prophet, what is the best form of jihad or struggle, which is what jihad means. It means a struggle, an internal struggle. Mm-hmm. And our beloved Prophet responded and said, the best form of struggle is a word of truth to a tyrannical ruler. And I use that as an example to Donald Trump, basically saying, like, if you really want to, you know, be somebody, do something and protect your people, just make sure that you are the person that stands up in front of our tyrannical ruler and, and speaks truth and never be afraid. I thought you were trying to declare war. Woo! Next thing you know, I wake up, I'm trending on Twitter for two days. They're out here talking about arrest her for treason, hang her in Washington, D.C., all kinds of crazy stuff. And it was because folks want to co-opt our language. Like, jihad is not an English word. It's an Arabic word. Like, how mm. you get to describe and tell me and define for me what my faith is. Yeah. I don't go around telling Christians how to practice their faith. I don't tell Jews how to cra- practice their faith, so Sikhs or Hindus. But for some reason, everybody wants to define the Muslims. So for me, I could have been like, sorry, I didn't mean to like, you know, I was like, no, I was like, I'm doubling down this time. You know, I'm willing to take one for the team. And I was like, look, this is my faith. I get to define it. You don't get to define me. I went to the Washington Post. I wrote an op-ed. It it ran like in the Sunday paper and it was called um, I'm I'm every Islamophobe's worst nightmare. And the reason I say that is because I shadow every stereotype. 
you know, they expect Muslim women like me to be sitting at home cooking and cleaning. You know, we're these like silent, subservient women. Um, you know, we live in these patriarchal societies. Uh, and, you know, and that we're not progressive. We're some backwards people. And, and, and they see me and they're like, damn, this woman is just out here messing up all the propaganda. And I'm like, this is actually who my people are. I mean, you see them. You see them in the communities. You hang out with them. This is who we are. We're people. We're, we're trying to make it in New York City. We're trying to live. We're trying to feed our families. You know, we got aspirations. We got dreams for our families and kids. Um, and again, like, we are here in America because there's religious freedom. Like, mm-hmm. I should be able to practice my faith and preach and do whatever I need to do. And everybody else should be able to do that, too. But for some reason, particularly evangelical, like the really right wing evangelical Christians, the, the Donald Trump, the folks that are like hanging out with the Donald Trump, that's how he actually won office. His mm-hmm. whole election was about the Muslims. Got to protect us from the Muslims. Let's right. ban the Muslims. Like, And his base loved that. Like That was their thing. We're going to protect this nation. Mm-hmm. And what that does is for the Muslims that aren't here. We dehumanize them so we could be like, let's. We might have a war with Iran, and people are like, yeah, of course, because you know what we know is those are bad people. Mm-hmm. And then for the people who live here, we somehow become the enemies of the state, and so people start looking at us like we're not part of the, the American society when we have been. And one of the things that is important to me is that as a Muslim, of course, I my parents are not born here, but Muslims been in this country. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have the lineage of the Muhammad Ali's and the Malcolm X's, and we have lineage that goes back to enslaved Africans. As you know, in Africa, there weren't wasn't Christianity mm-hmm. that many you know centuries ago. And a lot of the folks that were forced to come here were Muslims. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, that's also my lineage. Even though I'm not African-American, my lineage is of enslaved African Muslims who came here. And somehow, somehow they living under the watches of slave masters, they were able to hold that in their heart. So when they became semi-free, that's how Islam spread in America. That's how when my immigrant parents or grandparents came here, they were able to be like, yo, salamu alaikum, I'm a Muslim. Like my parents didn't have to sacrifice that much to be Muslims in America because there was already mosques when they got here. There was already a community. There was already a legacy of, you know, Elijah Muhammad and, you know, Malcolm X and and the larger black kind of Muslim movement in America. And so that's also part of my story. What are your thoughts on, on, you mentioned the FBI a lot, right? And and it's kind of like, I guess, a love-hate relationship (laughs) because I guess they help you in certain aspects, but then they against you in certain aspects, I would say. What I always tell people all the time is that, you know, um, we got to find ways to police our own communities and be able to protect one another. You know, the whole thing about you see something that you think is suspicious because you're a regular person, you pick up the phone and start calling cops on black people and then the mm-hmm. end up end result sometimes ends up being the murder of that black person. Mm-hmm. So so obviously you all know I'm on, I'm a, I, that's been my work for the last 20 years around law enforcement accountability. When it comes to the cops and in particularly the FBI, if anybody, if everybody that's listening forgets everything that I said today but remembers this one thing, Never let the FBI into your house. And if the FBI comes to your house and look, looks for you, the first thing that you say is, I will not speak to you without my lawyer. Don't worry about the lawyer. We figure out the lawyer part later, but you got to say, because what happens is what people don't know is when they, excuse me, when they hear FBI, they get scared. That's not they your let lawyer, them. is it? Yeah. It's not the FBI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like, who yeah. house phone is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, when the FBI comes to folks' house, they get scared. Or when the cops come to your house, you get scared and you want to like be like, I'm innocent. I didn't do nothing. And you get, let them in your house. And what people don't know is if they don't got search warrants, you let them into your house. Anything that they touch in your house becomes their property, right? You know, your any any anything that you say to cops or anything that you say to the FBI, it can and will be used against you in a court of law. So my thing is protect yourself. And a lot of people will say, Linda, I'm low income. Like I'm out here just trying to live. Like I don't got no money for no lawyer. We got resources. You know, look us up. Um, online you can go you know DM us on until freedom like we can help you there's a lot of people out here providing legal services and that's how a lot of people a lot of our people do get in trouble because they go saying too much stuff right and don't know what they're saying and then end up putting themselves in trouble that they shouldn't have never been in in the first place so you have every right to have a lawyer before you speak to law enforcement in, in chapter 13 you talk about the NYPD's infiltration into the Muslim community and your experiences being spied on mm-hmm. how do you trust people and that's the and that's the thing about, you know, when we talk about, you know, we were talking about obviously about, um, you know, like Bloomberg and stop and frisk and things like that. Um, you know, unwarranted spying is similar to stop and frisk in the sense that it's basically racial and religious profiling, but in a different way. So when stop and frisk is something visual, you see it, you stop the kids on the street with spying. Literally, it's technological surveillance. It is sending informants and what the NYPD themselves called moss crawlers and rakers that's what they call them moss crawlers and rakers that's what they call them and rakers if you think about what a rake does a rake goes in rakes out 
right, which means that they're picking up stuff. So what they do is oftentimes there have been cases of, you know, uh, informants for the NYPD who will go and kind of, you know, be what we call provocateurs, you know, in places. And similar happens in like when you're doing when they're doing like the narcotics, you know, trying to just pick up people or get people to say something or kind of entice them into, um, you know, particularly young people or people with like mental illness and things like that, which is most of the people that they've been, um, you know, that that you see in the news uh, oftentimes. Uh, the program, the demographics unit of, of the NYPD, which is what mapped the Muslim community. So I want you to imagine this. They mapped 250 mosques in New York City. They were sending informants on whitewater rafting trips with NYU Muslim students. Like, nowhere is safe. They were mapping all of our restaurants, basically being like, this restaurant is owned by this Egyptian guy. He's, you know, Sunni and trying to act like they knew, they knew the difference between Sunnis and Shias. We don't even know the difference mm-hmm. sometimes in our own community. And they were wrong often when you looked at the documents that they had. And what that does is it's psychological warfare. Because you might be, I might be sitting with you at a coffee shop in my community and you might be like, yo, what do you think about what's happening in Iran right now? And the first instinct I have is like, do I know you and why are you asking me political questions mm-hmm. instead of being like oh that's my brother he's just trying to have a conversation right. and so that's what it does it breaks the fabric Oof. of your community like you be at the mosque praying and you're wondering like is this guy really like my people or is he yeah, with the yeah. NYPD is he with the feds and that's the thing about it it's, it's very like really pervasive in a way that people don't realize and that's what they've done in our community I mean I talk about it in the book I personally have been visited by informants I always tell people I got an informant radar like I could tell when you're an informant because mm-hmm. actually they're not very well trained these are people oftentimes who have had trouble with the law minor stuff and then the NYPD comes and says look I could take care of you I could take that off your record but you got to do me a favor go back into this community get me some information so a lot of our people who some have kids you know some of them have been picked up might have to go to prison for five months you know who's going to pay their rent so they get into a vulnerable situation it's similar to when people you know you know like arrest not the guy that's the seller or the dealer of the drugs, maybe the guy that bought the drugs, mm-hmm. and they say to him, look, I'll, you know, I'm going to get you off if you tell me who sold the drugs to you or where you got the drugs and kind of get people in a vulnerable state. And that's what this NYPD surveillance program did. We sued the NYPD. We then demanded that the NYPD close down their demographics unit, which they did do when de Blasio came into um, office. So there's been some changes at the New York Police Department, but as you've watched their behavior lately, there's just some things too deep that you can't change. And you, how, how do you know when somebody's fake? Like they walk up on you and be like, Asalaamu Bacon. It's like, for example, in the book, I share stupid, a story man. of this guy who kept on like calling my organization looking for me personally. And he had a, a story to share like that, that he wanted to see me because he wanted to register for university or some story like that. Kept on telling him, bro, we got social security, you know, we got like caseworkers like you don't got to see me. I'm the boss. You, we have people who work here who can see you. Mm-hmm. Eventually, he still found me, came to my organization. I said, you know what? Let me talk to you. What do you want? It was he forgot what the original story was of why he wanted to see me. <laughs> and then he started looking around my office like, oh, like who funds you? Like who's, you know, like, pretty obvious. Wait, I'm like, really? Like you need to go yeah. back to a little more training. Like people that you could tell are like. And then there was a story also of a guy who entrapped this young uh, Pakistani kid in my community uh, who was like this 55 year old like Egyptian guy, handsome. His arms were working. His legs were working. Like, he looked, like, you know, really intellectual. Like, what do you do for a living? Why are you always in the coffee shops? Why are you always sitting at the bench outside? Why are you always everywhere? You know, why are you in the mosque? Why are you always talking to people? Like, people get suspicious. Yeah. Like, you know, like, you a young man. Like, you always just free? Like, you, who's yeah. your family? Where's your wife? You know, where's, where's the kids? So there's particular profiles where there are things that are red flags. Now, mind you, sometimes you could be wrong. You know what I mean? Like you could actually just be a normal person, but that's what the psychological warfare of this type of unwarranted surveillance. I mean, it was to the point where they were screenshot, uh, like uh, taking photos of people's license plates that were going to the mosque. Wow. And this, by the way, just so folks know, like is not just something I'm sharing with you because everything in this book is fact checked. This is actually part of the Associated Press in 2011 started an expose based on secret documents that were leaked from NYPD officials. Like, even NYPD people on the inside were like, yo, this is crazy, like, what we're doing right here. So they leaked a box of about 5,500 pieces of paper documents that are secret documents. They leaked it to the New York Times and the Associated Press. And the Associated Press was the only media outlet that was like, let me open this box and see what's in here. And when they opened it, they started doing exposés. They won the Pulitzer Prize, those four reporters, won the Pulitzer Prize based on that expose because it was such rich information. Like, it was outrageous. And they also wrote a book that became a bestseller called Enemies Within. And it was basically mapping how the NYPD program, where it came from, what the the psychology, like, 
how did the NYPD come up with the plan to just map all the Muslims? You know what I mean? Mm. Like, wh- how, where did that come from? And so what I could tell people is, like, this is not just some, like, paranoid community that just thinks we're being spied on. We knew for a fact, but nobody believed us. It took for some AP reporters to look through some secret documents where you saw your organization's name. You saw the imam's names were on it. Like, they were going after our communities. And the last thing I'll say about that is, it wasn't just like the guy went to the mosque and was like listening to the imam to see what the imam was saying. It was to the point where they built these con- what they call confidential informant profiles. So let's say my organization was serving immigrants, refugees, doing English classes, you know, the usual stuff, legal services. They were like, okay, we're looking for someone who may be Syrian, Palestinian, maybe Yemeni, maybe Egyptian between these ages, who is a business owner, a doctor, or something with that profile, so that they can put these people on the board of directors of our organization. Like, we are private organizations. Like, you become an informant and you get on my board of directors, you have access to client information, you got access to everything that we have. So it was very pervasive. It wasn't just people sitting in coffee shops listening. It was them trying to get into the infrastructure of the community. And we know this is a long practice of NYPD Mm -hmm. and FBI. You know this from the days of NOI Mm -hmm. and Malcolm X and, you know, even the the civil rights movement, the COINTELPRO. Yeah. So for us, this is like COINTELPRO 2.0. Wow. Um, and 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 unfortunately, it's it's hurt a lot of people in our community. In chapter uh, eighteen, I love I love the title of chapter eighteen. Silence will not protect you. You tell a story about a a, a Arab family who did something very interesting just to feel safe. Listen, I mean, silence, uh, and, and this is an, an, uh, comes from Audre Lorde, this mm-hmm. idea of that sometimes when you're silent, people might actually think you're enjoying it. You know, they might think that you don't think it's so bad. So the idea of silence will not protect you, it just doesn't. And I'll give a share, share with you a story. I was, um, you know, after I, all of you know that I was a Bernie supporter also in 2016. Um, you know, Bernie doesn't win the nomination. I'm not stupid. I'm not naive. I was like, look, I don't want Donald Trump to be my president. So I started organizing for Hillary. I go to Ohio. I'm I'm with this white girl volunteer. Me and her are walking in the streets in this like kind of like a rural part of I, uh, Ohio. Walking down the street, we got this list. I look up at this house. I see a Muslim woman coming out with a hijab, giving her husband a cup of water. Goes inside, and I and then I look at the list, but the <clears throat> address ain't on my list. Mm-hmm. And then so I look at the girl. I'm like, I'm going up to this uh, patio, and she's like, but that ain't on our list. I was like, don't worry, those are my people. I want to go talk mm-hmm. to them. And the reason why I wanted to talk to them was because there was a Trump sign outside of their house. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is not, this is interesting. Yeah. Like, why, why is this happening? <laughs> so I go up, you know, I get into, I'm like, assalamu alaikum. And this older Egyptian guy, I'm talking to him, whatever, very sweet old man, just chilling. And I'm like, you know, muster up the courage to be like, um, you know, so uncle, like, why you got a Trump sign outside? So he looks up and he's like, look around the street. And I look around and he's right. There's a lot of Trump signs. And he's like, imagine if I'm the one without the Trump sign. Oof. And I was Man. like, so it didn't even occur to me. Right. Like, I'm going in Man. here from New York City being like, what you mean you got a Trump sign outside your house? And he said, you know, that's for me, that's protection right there. Mm. So him putting a Trump sign outside of his house, acting like he's with everybody else, makes him and his family feel safe. So then I asked him a question. I said, okay, I get that now. You know, he really like shook me, but I get it. I said, but you're not going to vote for him in this election, right? You know what he said to me? He said, he said, what if Donald Trump don't win? I said, you know, because I'm in there being righteous. I'm like, well, we don't want him to win. And he's like, but what if he don't win? He's like, who you think they're going to blame for him not winning? And he looked at me for a little bit, and he's like, he going to blame you and me. Mm. And, you know, mind you, I live in Brooklyn. He lives in, like, a rural part of Ohio. So the way his context and the way he thinks about things is a lot different than mine. So sometimes people's our fear causes them to be silent instead of them being like, Putting, he could have, if he wanted to, he could have put a sign of Hillary outside, mm-hmm. or he could have put a no sign at all, or he could have been talking to his neighbors like, no, I'm not voting for Trump because I'm Muslim and this is what Trump believes about our people. But he decided to use a different. I'm not saying I judge him or that I don't understand him, mm-hmm. but what I tell people that we got to come to a moment and realize that silence is not going to protect us. Right. And in fact, si- not only will silence not protect you, but when you silent, things stay the same because right. people are like, ain't nobody complaining, so. And no one's saying that this is not right. So why am I gonna? Why are the people in power gonna change the things if we're all just sitting around being like, well, that's just another day and another bad thing that just happened. So I tell people like, say something, use your voice. I'm not saying put yourself in dangerous situations. Obviously, you know, Tamika and I, we put ourselves in dangerous situations all the time. It's not for everybody. That's why y'all superheroes. But, you know, and, and for me and you know this, sh- all of you, you know, like we got kids mm-hmm. like, you know, when my kids see this stuff, you know, you pick you open the news channel every day in the newspaper, you know, all around you. Imagine, you know, when it, like your kids looking at you like what like what are you doing? 
And so for me, like, I got kids that, like, watch me every day, what I'm doing, what I'm saying, you know, and I want them to know, like, you got to be unapologetic about who you are. And that's another thing about my book, even though it's my story and my journey, but the real message in this book is just be unapologetic about who you are. Don't ever let anyone tell you how to be, who to be. And I even say this in the book. A lot of people, you know, like, sometimes they walk into a room or an interview and they want to be, like, less black or less Palestinian or, like, less Muslim because they think that we got to be palpable to people in power, oftentimes white people. And I tell people, no, this is not how it works because you got to break the cycle. At some point, some of us got to figure out how to get to those places where we're the ones that are in decision-making power. And I think we're on the path there, which is how you get the Ayanna Presleys and how you get the right. AOCs and how you get the Ilhans and the Rashidas and the many more like them. And, you know, in 2021 in New York City, we got major elections in New mm-hmm. York City. 26 open city council seats, the mayor, there is a new mayoral, uh, you know, uh, open mayoral seat, open comptroll. And there's going to be a lot of black people, a lot of people of color running, a lot of women running. Mm-hmm. You can't be like, I don't know if that black woman can win. Like, that's what we do. Mm-hmm. We did that, you know, we did that. I mean, I'm a Bernie supporter, but they did that at Elizabeth Warren. Oh, I don't know if the women can win. You got to sometimes be the one that says, no, she actually can win. You know why? Because I'm going to help her. What do you and say, I'm going to help her. What do you say to people who are like, I don't like any of the nominees, so I'm just going to sit this out, or I don't want to participate, or it's, it's not going to happen for us anyway. Mm-hmm. Trump's going to win. What do you say to that? I'll say to folks this. Look, I respect people's decisions like you may not like any of the nominees and that's actually could be really true and they could be we, I'm not saying we got the most high quality candidates in the race right now but what I say to people is I want you to think of one thing which a lot of times we don't talk about in our community it's the Supreme Court if Trump gets four more years he's getting another nominee like Ruth Gator Ginsburg is hero yeah. but the lady's old like we cannot expect this lady to live till she's 150 years old so we got to just think to ourselves and say maybe maybe I'm not electing a, a candidate that I like Maybe I'm electing my next opponent in the White House. That's how I think about it. So when I was uh, supporting Hillary in 2016 after Bernie, I wasn't like, oh, Hillary's amazing. I was like, you know what? I'd rather fight Hillary than fight Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And that's how I'm thinking about this election as well. Who's my opponent in the White House? But what I will say to folks is this. Don't, Don't always come up every four years and think about the presidency. There is a lot of down ballot races. It actually don't even matter who the president is if we still got a Republican Senate. Mm -hmm. So think about who comes after the president, who's running in your district, who's running for Congress, who's running for city council, who's running for, you know, school board. Like start from the top of the ballot and go to the bottom of the ballot. And that's what our people do. They go to the polls. They start at the top and they leave. No, actually, whatever's on the bottom, all the way on the bottom is more important because those people are local. Like those are the people that got actual impact on your life in your local community. So I'm saying to people like, I, I'm with you. I get the frustration. I'm not going to judge people who make decisions to stay home. But there are future generations who are counting on us. And you're talking about a government who doesn't believe in climate change. They don't believe in racial justice, economic justice. These are people who are trying to roll back LGBTQ rights and all kinds of things. Women's rights. Women's rights, reproductive rights, literally trying to take us back 100 years, and I'm not even exaggerating. Do it for the people. Right. And don't go to the polls. I, and I say this to people all the time. When I go to the polls, I don't vote for me. It's not about my feelings. I think about black moms in my community, undocumented women in my community. I think about my own immigrant mom. I think about my dad who's sick and just had cancer last year, thinking about our horrific healthcare system. You know, one of the reasons why I support Bernie, and to be honest with you, people think it's some profound thing. It's not profound. I just want healthcare. Like, that's really it. You vote in your interests. I'm voting healthcare. I want every American to have healthcare. People shouldn't be dying in our communities or going to the hospital to the point of emergency because they don't have money. Like right now, coronavirus. Oh, if you feel sick, get yourself to the doctor. What if you don't got health care? Mm-hmm. What if you can't afford to go to the doctor to see whether or not you have corona? So for me, people do vote those types of interests, right? They vote very specific things. But what I'm asking people to do is like a solidarity vote. Like you don't like nobody, that's cool. Just go in there and knowing like what could happen if we get another four years of Trump. You know, you see these babies in the cages on the border mm-hmm. like that. Those are like those are babies. Those could be our babies. Like we watch, you know, this president all day, every day talking all this nonsense. You know, we banned the Muslims. Now we have 14 countries, 12 to 14 countries that are banned from coming to America. One of them Nigeria. is the largest African nation. Nigeria, Like, this is a president who's like, I don't want black people here and I don't want the Muslims, which sometimes can be both of those things. To just do a solidarity vote. Vote for me. Vote for your undocumented neighbors. You know, vote for black people. Vote for the people who are going to be the most marginalized and who are already marginalized even before Trump, but the ones that are going to be even more marginalized under a Trump administration. Pick up the book, too, man. That's right. We are not here to be bystanders. And we thank you and appreciate you for joining us.
out right now. That's Thank right. Make you. Sure I appreciate you. Pick it up right you. now. Yep. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere you can get a book. All right, Linda Sasa. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Did he get it right? <laughs>